Hey, we ready for this? Today, we're talking about some lions. We're talking about a dude named Daniel. This is gonna be good. This is his word unveiled, and we're going after the heart of God, reading through the whole word of the Lord, and we are discovering how great, how deep his love is for us. We are going after his heart, and we are seeing his heart in absolutely beautiful ways. So, Today, Daniel and the Lion's Den, we are going to read Daniel chapter 6. So just one chapter. We're doing one chapter at a time in the book of Daniel. Such good truth. So let's do this. This is a familiar pa um, passage. So just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, let's understand that this can be a very familiar passage. Therefore, we need to press in even deeper, that we cannot get caught up in this trap of, hey, I know that, I know what happens, I know what's next, I know you know this information, this detail in it, I've heard it all before, let's not go there. Let's not go there. Let's say, okay, God, I'm gonna read this like I've never read it before, and we are declaring a newness to just be poured out upon us as we read this chapter. Let's read it with purpose. We're not going to waste our time and read it like we know what it says. We're not going to limit the Lord. We're going to say, okay, God, whatever I do know, I am believing that there is more. I'm believing that you have me positioned right here, right now in reading Daniel chapter six so that you can reveal things to me like I've never seen before. Things in ways that I've never experienced before. That's what God can do. We cannot limit him. He is fully capable of rocking our world through a passage so familiar as Daniel and the lion's den. So let's do this. Daniel chapter six, hit that pause button, read yourself, meet with the Lord. Don't rush over, don't skip through. Be so leaning in, leaning in, diving in deeper and letting God take us as deep as we need to go today. So read, I'm praying, let's do this. Lord, we love you, we love you, we love you, we love you. You are so, so good. You are righteous and faithful and all powerful. Father, you are a God of movement. You are a God of newness. You are a God of transformation. You are a God of restoration. You are a God of vision. You are a God of holiness and peace and rest. Lord, you are all things that we need. You are all things that, that are good and, and full of life. Lord, meet with us today. We want to see you. We want to know you. We want to learn from you. We want to glean from you. We want to be so exposed and saturated by your righteousness and by your truth. Give us that revelation and that insight to truly just see you and to go deeper into, into those beautiful places of your heart. Lord, we just want more of you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Daniel chapter 6. Okay. Verse 1. Um, okay, we finished up with Daniel chapter 5, verse 31, talking about so Darius the Mede. So we had Belshazzar, and he died. Um, he died that same night when Daniel came in, interpreted this vision. Belshazzar died as the, the Medes then came and attacked, came up against Babylon, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom and took over. Verse 1, it seemed good to Darius to appoint 120 satraps over the kingdom that they would be in charge of the whole kingdom and over them three commissioners of whom Daniel was one, that these satraps might be accountable to them and that the king might not suffer loss. So in his wisdom, he's doing a great job. He's thinking, okay, 120 satraps of these people over the kingdom and then I'm going to appoint three people, three of like my main people, my good people, like They'd be good dudes, full of intelligence. They know what they're doing. They're so good at just administrative stuff and, and, and they're gonna oversee all of these satraps. So there's gonna be three of them. So it's Daniel and then two other guys who we learn really quickly um, become very full of jealousy because of Daniel. Verse three, then this Daniel began distinguishing himself among the commissioners and satraps because he possessed an extraordinary spirit and the king planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom. So these commissioners and the satraps began trying to find um, a ground of accusation, it says, against Daniel. They tried to find everything to bring him down. They know 
that Darius is really like in Daniel, that they're clicking, they're connecting, that he is being distinguished among all of the others, it says, um, because of his extraordinary spirit. So these commissioners, they come after Daniel. They're trying to find one thing that he'll mess up on, one thing that they can go back and tattle on him for and say, oh, Daniel did this. Daniel messed this up. Daniel did this. And it's so, it's so crazy cool that they can't find a single thing. There's nothing that they can find that Daniel is doing wrong or that, that Daniel, um, you know, fails in or stumbles in. It says, inasmuch as he was faithful and no negligence or corruption was to be found in him. Verse five, then these men said, we will not find any ground of accusation against this Daniel unless we find it against him with regard to the law of his God. So they look at Daniel, they're like, how how can we figure out something that this dude does wrong? Couldn't find a single thing. So they start looking, okay, who is Daniel? Let's figure this out. Who is he? What is most important to him? And they know that he follows the Lord. It is known to everyone that Daniel is a man who seeks the Lord, who worships God and only God, who prays faithfully to God. People know this. So they're going after that something with regard to the law of his God. It says, so then these commissioners and satraps came by agreement, it says in verse six, they came to um, King Darius and they're all, you know, they're all sugarcoating this. They are all like kissing some booty and they're saying, okay, King Darius, live forever. You know, we're here for you. We're looking out for you. And they come and they're like, you know, we're all thinking we got together and everyone agrees. And we think this is such a good thing for you to establish your kingdom, for you to grow stronger, for your kingdom to, you know, grow and be even more and more established. And they say, um, they go to him and say that the king should establish a statute and enforce an injunction that anyone who makes a petition to any God or man besides you, O king, for 30 days shall be cast into the lion's den. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it may not be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which may not be revoked. So the Medes and Persians, part of just what they do and how they rule is when they when they make a rule and that signet ring, it's placed in that, that document that it's signed by the king, no matter what, it cannot be revoked. So that king cannot say, oh, never mind, I changed my mind. If that signet ring's there, it's got to remain. So they're urging him and saying, hey, sign this. You know, this is great that no one, no one can do anything and have anything to do with worshiping any other man or thing or God but you. That, that you alone should be worshipped and, and all this honor and, and respect, you know, be towards you and only you. Then they said, anyone, anyone who does this, anyone who, who, um, who bows down, who worships, who pays homage or who does any of this to anyone but you for 30 days. Now get this, they are giving, they are giving Daniel 30 days saying, oh, well maybe he can go, you know, you know, maybe he can't go 30 days. We're, we're going to say 30 days. This dude can't even go a day without praying to his God. He's that faithful. He's that consistent in the way that he lives and seeks after God with such passionate pursuit. So unbelievable. But they say, O king, for 30 days, anyone who does this before 30 days shall be cast into the lion's den. And they're like, okay, hurry up, sign it. This is going to be so good for you. This, people are going to see how great you are. This is so good. So they're buttering him up. And verse 9, therefore King Darius signed the document. That is the injunction. Verse 10, now when Daniel knew that the document, document was signed, when he knew what this said, what it was about, and that Darius signed it, he entered his house now in his roof chamber, he had windows open toward Jerusalem and he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God as he had been doing previously. Nothing changed. Nothing changed. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and supplication before his God. Okay. This is what I love. I'm going to read this. I'm going to read what, what God just laid on my heart and I just started writing because I'm, I'm reading verse 10 and it kills me. It just grips my heart. It grips everything within me. So I'm going to read this concerning verse 10 that we just read about what Daniel did. He continued kneeling. He went on doing what he did, what he has always done 
as he had been doing previously. After he heard, when he heard, it says, now when Daniel knew that the document was signed, he just went on doing life as he always had been. So I'm going to read this, what um, the Lord just placed on my heart. Daniel had an intentional prayer connection with God every day. He chose to meet with God three specific times every day. When Daniel heard that the king, who was considered close enough to be a friend, signed a document, when he heard he had signed a document prohibiting his prayers, Daniel wasn't shaken. Nothing changed. He had made a habit out of meeting with God, and habits are hard to break. Prayer was a purposeful, consistent part of Daniel's life. Those powerful moments with God were engraved upon his heart. He didn't sweat the signed document. He didn't complain to the king about the unfairness of the law. He didn't hide or cower in fear when the threat was there. He simply continued doing what he had always done. He had prayed enough to know that God is a God who is good, a God who sees and hears, even when things aren't quite lining up in our favor. Daniel knew that he was praying not in vain, but with purpose and with faith and to a God who delivers. He knew this, therefore nothing changed. He kept praying. That's, that's what it is. Nothing, nothing changed. It was so much a part of his life that he just continued doing. It was a natural way of living. This is what I do. There's no life. There's no purpose. There's no meaning outside of this, outside of meeting with the Lord. Okay, so these commissioners, these satraps, they find Daniel doing this, and of course, they go right to the king. Of course, they say, hey, didn't we say this? Didn't you sign this? Didn't we say the result of this would be that man would be thrown into the, the lion's den? And they're like, oh, well, guess what? We found Daniel. We, we found Daniel doing this. In verse 13, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or to the injunction which you signed, but keeps making his petition three times a day. Verse 14, that as soon as the king heard this statement, he was deeply distressed and set his mind on delivering Daniel. And even until sunset, he kept exerting himself to rescue him. So we see this friendship. We see how close Darius and Daniel are. That King Darius, he thought so much of Daniel. He considered him close enough to be a friend. Um, in this, when he heard this, it says he was deeply distressed. He was grieved. He was so troubled. And he tried to find out a way to figure something out to save Daniel. But according to um, according to the, the Medes and the Persians, when that king signs that document with his signet ring, there is nothing that can be done. There's nothing that can change what he just signed, what he just put his ring into. And the commissioners and the satraps who, who um, caused this to happen, who went deceitfully up against Daniel in causing this document to be signed, those are the ones who said, hey, King, I don't know why you're wasting your time. Nothing can be changed. You can't revoke it, so let's just get on with this. Let's just throw Daniel on down there in the lion's den so we have no competition left, so we don't need to worry about him getting more than us. It all stemmed from this jealousy. It all stemmed from this that them and this comparison game and not liking Daniel getting all of the attention. That's what this stems from. So they're like, there's nothing you can do. Let's just get this done. Verse 16, then the king gave orders and Daniel was brought in and cast into the lion's den. The king spoke and said to Daniel, your God, whom you constantly serve, will himself deliver you. Then it said a stone was brought, laid over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring, with the signet rings of his nobles, so that nothing would be changed in regard to Daniel. What's done was done. And when he signed that ring, it had to be done. Daniel, he wasn't phased. He continued doing. It says he knew. When Daniel knew that the document was signed, he entered his house and did what he always did. Nothing swayed him. He didn't sit there and think about it. He didn't weigh out the risk or the cost. He just said, this is what I do. No matter what anybody else is doing, no matter what y'all are doing, no matter what y'all say, no matter what's coming up against me, this is what I do. This is, this is what I do. I meet with the Lord. I seek the Lord. I trust him. Verse 18, then the king went off to his palace and spent the night fasting and no entertainment was brought before him and his sleep fled from him. So we just see this, this troubling um, and this grieving in his spirit. 
verse, um, it says the king arose the next day. He ran in haste to the lion's den, verse 20. When he came near the den to lion, he cried out with a troubled voice. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you constantly serve been able to deliver you from the lions? Then of course Daniel spoke and said, O king, live forever. Verse 22, my God, his angel, uh, my, I'm sorry, my God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth and they have not harmed me. And as much as I was found innocent before him and also toward you, O king, I have committed no crime. It says the king is pleased and, and I can imagine they just embrace like crazy and he's so, he's so thrilled. He continues speaking and says because he had trusted in his God. The king says this, this is what happened. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, no injury Whatever was found, I'm sorry, the king didn't say this, but nothing was found, no injury at all, no markings on him because he had trusted in his God. That's why he came out not injured, not harmed, not sweating. He's fine because he trusted in his God. Verse 24, the king then gave orders and they brought those men who had maliciously accused Daniel and they cast them and their children and their wives. They threw them in the lion's den. So those who were malicious, those who were deceiving, this is the righteousness of God. That those who come up against God's people, there is judgment against them. And we see this, that those who came up against Daniel, they were the ones thrown in the lion's den. And though Daniel had no markings, no injury, no nothing on him, it said that, that these these men and their wives and their children, they didn't even reach the bottom of the pit before the lions got to them, before the lions just ravaged them, literally just ate them up. It says and crushed all their bones. They didn't hit the bottom of the den um, before they crushed all their bones. Verse 25, then Darius the king wrote to all the peoples, nations, and men of every language who were living in all the land, may your peace abound. I make a decree that in all the dominion of my kingdom, men are to fear and tremble before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and enduring forever. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. And his dominion will be forever. He delivers and rescues and performs signs and wonders in heaven and on earth, who has also delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. Verse 28. So this Daniel enjoyed success in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. This is so, this is so, so legit. It's amazing how the Lord makes himself known through the acknowledgement and proclamation of not only God's people, not only God's people um, and God's chosen Israel, but of those holding Israel captive. He's making himself known in, in this acknowledgement, in this recognition, in this seeing his glory and his hand at work. Not only is Israel seeing this, but these other nations. And God is appointing, appointing these kings and these men to be in their position so that they are in perfect position to speak and declare their acknowledgement and recognition of the Lord so that all the nations can see and hear. God positions them in those positions. We saw it with Nebuchadnezzar. We saw that that he then is, is like top guy. He's king of Babylon. And the Lord uses him and uses the faithfulness and obedience of his servants, of these men who choose to seek the Lord, using them to, to reveal the goodness of God, to reveal the power of God by their faithfulness, by their trust in the Lord. Nebuchadnezzar was positioned. He was in a position where so many people could hear, where so many people would pay attention to what he says because he's the king of Babylon. And we see the same thing now that Darius was in charge. He was king. He was this top guy that he now is speaking to all the people that he saw the trust and the way that, that Daniel prayed to the Lord, consistently went after the Lord, was not swayed or shaken up at all. That through that, God's power was revealed. What God could do, the God of miracles, the way that he delivers, the way that he rescues, the way that he works in lives. Darius saw that. And God appointed Darius at that time to be the one in that position where so many people would hear, so many people would pay attention. God knows exactly, exactly what he's doing. God gave Darius the same influence that he gave Nebuchadnezzar to speak to all men and all, um, and all nations of the great power of God. God knew it would be the result of one man's faithfulness and obedience to him. 
I'm amazed by the way that he lifts up unrighteous men. He lifts them up into these positions, these unrighteous men to show them the power of himself through the obedience and the surrender of righteous men in order to speak out from position of power for all the people to hear and know that he is the Lord. God rises them up in these positions. He uses, he uses unrighteous men to be in these very high positions so that righteous men could live their lives in a way that reveals to these unrighteous men the glory of God, the goodness of God, the power of God. So that all these nations would know that he is the Lord. That's what God's after. I love, I love studying and reading through the prayer life of Daniel. We go clear back to when Nebuchadnezzar wanted that dream known to him, like revealed to him that, that no one could do it. And here comes Daniel and he says, I'm going to give you the interpretation. And he prays. He tells his dudes, he's like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, like, here's what's going on. I need you to pray. I need you to help me pray that the Lord would have compassion and reveal this dream. And they pray and they pray hard. Daniel, Daniel's been praying for a long time. Daniel's made this a consistent natural way of life for a long time. He is a praying dude. And this is a consistent, powerful, powerful, just natural way that he's living his life. So we see that he prayed for that interpretation, for that mystery of that dream to be revealed. And then what did he do right after that? When God revealed that, he prayed again. He prayed some more. He's all about praying. It was just this all the time, constantly on his mind, remembering, talking to the Lord, praising the Lord, lifting up the Lord, living his life in a way where other people, when they look at Daniel, they see, they see the glory of God just radiating from him, overflowing from him. They knew. Those dudes knew. They knew the, the life that Daniel lived. They knew that if they were going to find anything, it had to be about his God because Daniel was all about his God. Everything revolved around his God. That's how I'm choosing to live. That's what I want. I want to be known for that, just loving God, that, that nothing else matters but God, but knowing my God, knowing him and the power of his resurrection. That's, that should be it. That, that is life. And when we focus on that, when we seek hard after the Lord, then everything else, everything else just, it flows, it works, it connects, it means something, it holds purpose, and it's driven with such power, such everything's coated with love. Because when we are just in the Lord, when we're all about Him, then everything of God just flows out. Just everything comes out in such a beautiful way. I love this passage. I love this story. I love, I love Daniel's prayer life. I love the example that we see in Daniel. I love the way that God works and appoints people and uses the unrighteous and the righteous and, and uses these places of position and this suffering even in the righteous and what that looks like, what that means as they remain faithful, as they continue seeking and trusting God. The result of it, the result is beautiful. The result is just bringing glory to God and allowing the whole earth, like all nations, the whole world, to know that he is the Lord. And a faithful, faithful God he is. Oh, it's so good. It's so, so good. This is so good. Love the book of Daniel. I know I've said that before, but do you not love the book of Daniel? The book of Daniel, seriously, guys. Okay. That's it. We did this. We did another chapter, Daniel and the Lion's Den. I just pray that you got so much more, that God's going to continue to take this deeper and awaken us to more. Even in these, these familiar passages, there's more. There's so much more for us to see and know. I can't wait for the next time I read through the Bible and what else God is going to show me and teach me and how much deeper I'm going to go with him. Cannot wait. Oh, this, this whole more, always more. So good. Okay. That's it. Finishing up with that. Thanks so much for walking this out. This journey has been amazing. I'm going to see you soon on my next video. Have a wonderful rest of your day just resting in the Lord, being still and being moved by his spirit. Mm, that's life. That's purpose. That's what I'm going for. That's what I'm all about. That's what I'm choosing. I so pray that you're going to join me. See you soon.